Hi, everyone, and thanks for listening to the Maritime History Podcast. Today's interlude episode is called simply Boats of Prehistory. As far as for where our topic today falls on the timeline of the past, it's a tad difficult to pinpoint. The boats that we're going to look at likely came into use at a time that predates written history altogether, but many of them are still used by various cultures around the world today. So far in our first season, we've made stops at the cultural powers of the Bronze Age world. We've seen some of them rise and fall while others have waxed and waned, yet remain standing as the Bronze Age drew to a close. We talked about the reed boats of early Mesopotamia, and we saw how Egypt's early papyrus rafts gave way to wooden vessels, vessels that were designed to imitate the form of their papyrus predecessors. Eventually, wood became the boat and shipbuilding material of choice for those who could afford it. Today, though, I want to circle back and look at the early boats that were used by some of the cultures whose written history didn't start until much later, but cultures that were undoubtedly busy in their own corners of the globe, even while Egypt was at its apex. These cultures include places like Northern Europe, the Americas, mainland Asia and the island cultures of Southeast Asia, down even to Oceania and Australia. Many of these regions are comprised of large numbers of islands, especially Polynesia and what we would call maritime Southeast Asia, so boats factor heavily in their history. Now to set the tone for our discussion today, here's the opening paragraph from a book called the Ancient Mariners, written by Lionel Casson, who was one of the early authorities and writers in the field of maritime history. He opened his book by saying the following, In the very beginning, men went down not to the sea, but to quiet waters, and not in ships, but in anything that would float, logs that could be straddled, rafts of wood or of bundles of reeds, perhaps even inflated skins. From there, he proceeds to discuss some of the earliest forms of watercraft used by prehistoric man, the very topic that will be our focus today. At the outset here, I should note the reason why I didn't tackle this conversation at the beginning of the podcast, the place where it fits chronologically. I feel that when it comes to history, it's important to stick to primary sources as much as is possible. That was one of my initial goals on the podcast, as it continues to be. If you've listened through to our current stage, you'll know that I do appreciate the utility of archaeology, scholarly research, any other field of study that can contribute to a more comprehensive view of history. The main reason that I've shied away from the earliest days of these other cultures is simply that we don't have any written primary evidence from them. Everything we know about their early development is based on archaeology and a piecing together of the information that's revealed thereby, which leaves us trying to form a coherent and internally logical theory of what happened in the past. This endeavor isn't entirely a shot in the dark, please don't misunderstand me. Many things about the human condition and the natural world remain constant, and can therefore be assumed to have applied to these early peoples, people that we know of only on the basis of their physical remains, and the presence of their progeny at the locations that were settled at some point in the distant past. One example here is principles of buoyancy remaining constant. While we define a principle like this in scientific terms today, our earliest ancestors must have discovered this same principle at some point and put it to good use. After all, just about anywhere you go on earth where there's a body of water, chances are that you'll find something floating there. Driftwood, a log, use your imagination. It's a short step from seeing that drifting log to then attempting a ride on the log. And the very first sailors to step off the shore and into the world of the ocean 
must have been possessed of no small amount of courage. The human urge to explore and push boundaries is undoubtedly another constant that must have played a role in our earliest forays into the vast ocean. We could probably list many other constants here, but I think you get the broad idea. Beyond these constants and the archaeological remains, we are left with theory. Many of these theories are reached via a backward extrapolation of the ways in which some cultures still interact with the rivers and seas today, taking their current practices and looking backward to see how they've changed through recorded history, and then by extension, how they could possibly have originated and changed in prehistory up to where the historical record begins. That's basically what I'd like to do today, to look at these theories as they currently exist and to see what the current thoughts are regarding the prehistoric watercraft of cultures around the world. In many areas of the world, some of these watercraft are still in use today by the indigenous people, a reality that actually goes a long way toward the formation of our views about prehistory. I suppose we can start with a boat that's been called the oldest boat found so far. As I'm too American for comfort, I'll stick to calling it the Pess Canoe, but I really like the name in Dutch. They call it Boot van Pes. The name of this canoe comes from the Dutch village that was near the boat's resting place, a location that was uncovered during the construction of a highway. The course of this highway ran through a basin that was filled with a peat deposit, so the workers had no choice but to dig up the peat and fill in the hole. As you may have foreseen, while digging up the peat deposit, they found what looked like a log, a minor inconvenience that they simply tossed on a cart and ignored while they finished up their work. If you've listened much to other podcasts about discoveries in prehistoric Europe, you'll no doubt be familiar with the great preservative environment that peat bogs and deposits can be, this case being no exception. Thankfully, several days after the workers deposited this log on the aforementioned cart, an observant, though some might say nosy, neighbor took a look at the log and immediately knew that it was something much more significant. We can overlook, and perhaps many of us understand and sympathize with, the neighbor's curiosity, especially since it was essential to the ultimate preservation of the pest canoe. The canoe was freeze-dried to preserve it for future study. Now, the main point to note in relation to the pest canoe is that it falls under the category of a dugout canoe. Many other examples of dugout canoes have been found around Europe and elsewhere, and many of these finds have been dated to very early times. The pest canoe was dated as early as 8000 BCE, on the basis of a pollen analysis, but... These dates aren't without controversy, nor is the theory that this artifact was even originally used as a boat. It makes a bit of sense that the oldest of watercraft would be fashioned as a dugout-style canoe. It's not very difficult to find a log, to hollow out part of it, fashion the ends into rudimentary rounded points, and then use the rest as a easily made flotation device. Indeed, even simple flint or antler and bone tools could be used to hollow out a dugout canoe. It would take a long time to do so with such tools, but, I mean, what other distractions did prehistoric man have, really? Study of the pest canoe has revealed marks in the hollowed-out portion that could indicate the use of flint tools, but others still claim that the item could have been an animal trough and would not be very seaworthy anyway. The general consensus, however, is that the pest canoe was indeed intended to be a dugout canoe. As I said, many other such dugout canoes have been found in numerous locations. The second oldest claimed dugout is the Dufuna canoe, found in Nigeria and carbon dated to around 8,000 years old. Many prehistoric dugout canoes have been found around Germany, Switzerland, the UK, and Ireland. 
and a quite heavy concentration in Northern Europe, particularly in Scandinavia. Younger examples of dugout canoes have also been found in the Americas, particularly in the Northwest, where the trees grow large, and throughout the islands of the Pacific. We could keep going, but the bottom line is that the dugout canoe is a universal example of the earliest of mankind's efforts at taking to the water. Just because it's one of the earliest forms of watercraft doesn't necessarily mean that it was the precursor of all other forms. This is one of the tricky aspects of peering this far back into prehistory. We can't say with any degree of certainty what came first, how it came to be, or so on. On one hand, the dugout must have been an early type of watercraft. It's easy to conceive of, easy to make, and it requires minimally sophisticated tools. Although metal tools were much more effective, I'm sure. On the other hand, you do actually need a log of large enough size to be useful, to fit a small person or persons into, and in some parts of the globe this presents a problem. The other problem with any theory is that, with a window of millennia as your focus, a large, single piece of wood is going to fare much better than would a hide boat or a reed boat or a bundle raft. It's a pure matter of mass and the effects of decomposition on varying materials. You catch my drift, I think. While dugout canoes may be the oldest watercraft types we found, we can't assume that they were the first forms of watercraft fashioned and used by prehistoric man. Thankfully for us, this attempt at backward extrapolation in forming a theory of the past leads us to other types of primitive watercraft that are still in use today around the world. Perhaps the most widespread of prehistoric watercraft was the raft, in its many and varied forms. Rafts could be made of logs, it would be a simple matter of finding the material necessary to lash two or more logs together, rather than hollowing out a single log. European explorers of the 19th century reported seeing Tasmanian natives afloat on rafts that were made of only two logs lashed together, and many scholars now think that this very same form could have been used by the Tasmanian ancestors who reached that far southern island in distant prehistory. Log rafts of one form or another are also thought to have been a main watercraft used during the gradual migrations from mainland China out through the various islands and landforms of Southeast Asia, all the way out into the Pacific and south to Australia. These migrations are generally dated as having occurred in the Stone Age, and though we don't have any physical remains of log rafts to confirm this theory, Log rafts are depicted at an 8th century Buddhist temple on the island of Java, and they were still used for fishing and navigation on the lakes and rivers of the Philippines and other nearby lands even into the 19th century. I'll post a great picture of the relief from the Buddhist temple, and make sure to note the outrigger that's connected to the ship. It's thought that many of the canoes and rafts used over the centuries of Austronesian migration were these outrigger-style vessels, equipped with flotation devices, attached to the main hull, and then attached to poles on either side of the vessel to increase stability, especially out on the open ocean. The depiction from the Java temple, called the Borobudur ship, is obviously more modern, it has sails and a stem, but the outrigger was probably common to even the most primitive of log rafts and bundle floats. The probable ubiquity of the many styles of raft stems from the reality that any buoyant material could be lashed together to form a serviceable raft, and in many places this is still done. Bamboo and large reeds in particular make for great raft bases. In Egypt, for instance, this is probably where their boat building began, eventually developing the papyrus reed boats into more sophisticated forms and designs. 
The Chinese also used bamboo in their rafts from a very early period, though in regions where suitable logs were available, the Chinese also made log rafts. A notable example of the log raft from Chinese history involves the 2nd century BC explorer Zhang Qian, who was said to have rowed a log raft to the source of the Yellow River, only to find himself floating in the Milky Way. Zheng Qian was a very important explorer in Chinese history, despite the mythology that's grown up around him, and he'll make for an awesome episode once we get there. But for now, we can just confirm that log rafts were indeed a worldwide method of water navigation early on in history. We haven't touched much on the craft used by the natives of North and South America yet, and beyond dugout canoes, outrigger canoes, log rafts, and bundle rafts, the main vessel type present there and elsewhere were hide canoes and bark canoes. Reed bundle rafts are, and probably were more common in South and Central America, where suitable reeds are more plentiful. And as I noted earlier, dugout canoes were common to the Pacific Northwest, where larger trees are easily gotten. Elsewhere, however, Bark boats were used widely, particularly in North America, but also in portions of Brazil and in the Amazon River Basin. A bark canoe is just what it sounds like, a canoe that has a skin fashioned of bark. Particularly in eastern Canada and the northeast United States, out of birch tree bark. Generally, a frame would be made out of other sturdy wood, and the birch bark would then be sewn together and stretched over the frame, then sealed with pitch from other nearby trees. This could be done on a smaller scale for the single-person-sized canoe that we instinctually envision, but it was also done for larger-sized boats, especially later on in history. Apart from the reality that this was the outgrowth of using natural materials from the environment in which these native peoples lived, the bark canoes and boats were advantageous for river navigation because they were very light, which gave the vessel better buoyancy and cargo capacity, with the added option of carrying the vessel overland if it became necessary. Writer and maritime archaeologist Sean McGrail tells us that after European colonization began, the Europeans found birch bark canoes to be ideal for wilderness travel, since they could be repaired using materials to hand. Indeed, a new boat could be built up using resources available close to rivers. The Europeans merely discovered something that the native peoples had known for centuries, possibly even millennia. Going back to a thought that we left a minute ago, the light construction of this boat style made it a style that didn't survive down through the ages to leave much archaeological trace for study today. It was sturdy when used by its builders, but much of what we know about the bark canoe's construction and use comes by virtue of the reality that Native Americans were using such boats when the European explorers arrived in America and documented the boats their makers, and their techniques. No primary historical record of the boating habits of pre-Columbian America has entered the record. We make do with what we have, though, as is always the case. A somewhat related watercraft type is the hide canoe or hide boat. It follows the same idea as the bark canoe, a central frame for stability over which the animal hide would be stretched. In many cases, these hide boats were round and quite small, the traditional name attached to such boats being the coracle, which is derived from Welsh and Irish Gaelic words that sound similar, though I won't butcher them with an attempted pronunciation. Generally, in the Welsh or Britonic version of the coracle, A frame of interwoven willow rods was tied together with bark from the same tree. Then, over the framework, hide was stretched with pitch used to waterproof the small boat. The coracle is also found in places around India, Vietnam, Iraq, and Tibet. 
But the thing that these places all have in common, along with Wales and Ireland, are a prevalence of rivers and a fishing trade or livelihood on those rivers and lakes. The coracle is really only good as a river or lake vessel, because it has a flat bottom that distributes the overall load well and keeps the draft minimal. Again, the relatively lightweight materials have meant that remains of coracles are quite rare, and we know of them mainly because of their continued use in many places today. As well, though, we have some early textual references to coracles being prevalent in Britain and Northern Europe. Herodotus mentions them as being used by the Assyrians, while Julius Caesar mentions them in this passage from his commentary on the Civil War. As things were reduced to such a strait, and all the roads were blocked by the Afranian soldiers and horsemen, and the bridges could not be completed, Caesar orders his men to build ships of the kind that his experience in Britain in previous years had taught him to make. The keels and the first ribs were made of light timber. The rest of the hull was wattled and covered with hides. Basically here what we're told is that Caesar had seen coracles being used during one of his trips to Britannia, and seeing their utility in certain contexts, he had some of his soldiers build coracles in Spain during a later campaign. Beyond the coracle, there are other boat types within the broad categorization of hide boats, but it's unclear when these other types were first adopted. As with the bark canoes and coracles, these other hide boats are constructed with a central frame over which the outer material is stretched. The difference is that the frame is generally made of driftwood or of whalebone and the outer skin was made of walrus or seal skin, stretched and waterproofed with seal oil. As you may have guessed then, these boats are mostly seen in Arctic regions and are built by the native Inuit and Yupik people, native to the regions of Alaska and further north. The Umiak is built after that fashion and is an open boat that can seat several people, while the more widely known kayak style is a smaller, sleeker version that can be built with the same materials. Both of these boat styles are much more recent creations, however, and likely weren't present in any prehistoric context. All in all, yet another boat that is closely tied to the environment in which the native sailors live, and a perfect example of man's ingenuity under any circumstance. The last type of boat that I want to touch on today is a type that wasn't prehistoric, technically, but it was used in the Bronze Age in Atlantic Europe. This type can be called a plank boat, and we actually have a fair amount of physical evidence of this type of boat. Several examples have been found, although they are understandably not complete. Three examples of plank boats were discovered in the same area of the Humber estuary in northern England, the boats named for the nearby village, North Ferriby. They've all been dated between 1900 and 1800 BCE, and Ferriby 1, as it's come to be called, yielded up a majority of the boat's bottom planking and a part of a side strake. The other boats were more degraded, but together they tell us most clearly that wooden plank vessels had been introduced in England, possibly used on the North Sea or the surrounding rivers. The planks on Ferriby 1 were quite intricately connected, the seams held fast with moss caulking. Another boat found in Brig, England, and therefore called the Brig Raft, is actually a fascinating topic because it looks like a raft, but it's technically a boat because it was made watertight, even though it is flat-bottomed. When in use, it would have looked something like a long rectangular box without a lid. It was about 12 meters long and 2 meters wide, so it was quite large, actually. The side strakes didn't reach very high, only half a meter at their highest point, which makes the brig raft 
undoubtedly a river transport vessel. The location where it was discovered actually indicates that it was used as a ferry across a creek that ran past the town itself, and it could have carried quite a load as it was pulled or paddled across the creek. Estimates are that it could have carried 26 sheep and 4 men at a time without a second side strake, or if it did have a second strake, it could have carried 17 cattle and 6 men. Quite a load for a relatively meek-looking riverboat. There are several other major examples of plank boats from England and Scandinavia, but these two examples are similar in nature to the rest. They indicate that England and other northern European locales had developed relatively sophisticated plank boat construction methods, using these boats as transport on the many rivers and lakes of northern Europe. Keep in mind, though, these plank boats are dated to the Bronze and Iron Ages of Europe, so while northerners were using modest plank boats as river transport, the Egyptians, Mycenaeans, and others had developed much larger seagoing ships. They did have a bit of a head start when it comes to civilization and its related advantages, though, so I guess it's a little unfair to compare. Getting away from the various boat types now, most of which we have covered in basic detail, let's talk about some of the modern attempts to recreate prehistoric vessels and to prove their seaworthiness. These endeavors had at their root the desire to show that peoples from various epochs could have successfully made transoceanic voyages with very rudimentary vessels. Navigation is another issue altogether, one that ought to have an episode all to itself, and which we may do at some point in the future. But for now, we should recognize that any prehistoric maritime endeavors would have had more to figure out when it came to navigation than they would have had to figure out when it came to building a serviceable boat. Anyway, one of these historic recreation voyages, probably the most famous one actually, was Thor Heyerdahl's Kontiki expedition. This expedition built a balsa wood raft made of nine balsa tree trunks lashed together with a hemp rope. Other materials available to prehistoric man were used to increase stability of the raft, and it was equipped with a wood mast structure and several sails. The main goal of the 1947 expedition of the Kontiki was to prove that Polynesia could have been settled by peoples from South America sailing westward over the Pacific Ocean, which contrasts with the long-reigning theory that people from Southeast Asia had simply continued on their eastward expansion. A key point in Heyerdahl's theory centered on similarities between the famous statues of Easter Island and some lesser-known statues at Lake Titicaca in Bolivia. Heyerdahl and his crew did manage to sail Kontiki 4,300 miles to Polynesia, proving that such a journey was possible. The feat did not, however, sway the scientific community in their belief that Polynesia was first colonized beginning in Asia. At the least, even though Heyerdahl's voyage didn't prove the occurrence of a pre-Columbian voyage from South America to Polynesia, he opened the door to that possibility and spurred others to keep searching for proof. The civilization of these remote Pacific islands has been, after all, a question that's plagued Western thinkers since Captain Cook first discovered the islands in the European exploration sense of the word discover. Cook is said to have uttered his bewilderment at the discovery, saying, how shall we account for this nation spreading itself so far over this vast ocean? I'll let you draw any conclusions regarding what this viewpoint reveals about the European mindset in the 18th century, but that's far enough down that avenue. Heyerdahl stood at the proverbial helm of several other expeditions over the course of his career. Ra 1 and 2 were papyrus reed boats built after the fashion of Egyptian depictions such as we've discussed already. 
He attempted on two occasions to sail the reed boat from Morocco across the Atlantic with the aid of the Canary Current, which is a surface current in the Atlantic that's driven mainly by wind patterns. Ra 1 made it 4,000 miles before taking on water and splitting in two. But the second go-round was more successful. Ultimately, I don't know that this expedition proves much in the way of prehistoric contact between Africa and the Americas, other than the theoretical possibility. There's really no evidence of such contact having occurred. Heyerdahl was involved with other similar expeditions, and there's actually a successor Contiki II voyage that's taking place right now, and you can check out live data on the boat's location and other such interesting info at contiki2.com. A historic recreation voyage that's maybe more applicable to our talk about prehistoric watercraft is one that's called the First Mariners Project. The name is well chosen because this project aims to determine the minimum technological requirements to cross the sea barriers that humans did indeed cross in prehistoric times. This project began back in 1996 and has since then undertaken numerous reconstruction projects of very basic raft types. Obviously, the reconstruction is just the start, though and the First Mariners Project has also attempted to navigate these rafts from various points around the world, all in an effort to prove that prehistoric man could indeed have made similar voyages with only rudimentary materials and navigation skills. One of their first successes was a crossing of the Timur Sea in 1998. Their goal was to replicate the first crossing of prehistoric man from the island of Timur, one of the southernmost islands of Indonesia, down to Australia proper. As we've mentioned several times today, they had no physical evidence of what type of craft mankind would have used in our earliest crossings of the sea, so they opted to use rudimentary tools and materials to construct a raft similar to those we discussed earlier. Their first attempt at building a bamboo raft met with some problems, but their second version was rather more seaworthy. It was an 18-meter bamboo raft that weighed nearly three tons. I find it interesting that the first version that ultimately proved unfit for the sea was built based on consultations with marine designers of modern vessels. The second version, the one that made the successful crossing, was built based on the advice of the indigenous Indonesian boat builders, the very people whose ancestors once made this same crossing in the distant past. The structural form they ended up using was relatively simple for such a large raft, but a raft of that size would have been necessary to make a sea crossing that lasted 13 days. The basic form was made of 87 bamboo stalks, arranged flat in three layers and held in place by eight cross timbers taken from tree trunks. I will, of course, post some pictures of this vessel on the site to give you an idea of the size and materials used, but if you're curious about the First Mariners Project and their other reconstructions and voyages, look for links to their site in the show notes for this episode as well. One thing that's always stood out to me when it comes to these prehistoric reconstruction projects is that although they use rudimentary materials and build raft-type vessels, they almost always include a sail on the vessel, and the vessels are normally pretty large. In this case, they did also use a 24-square-meter sail of woven palm leaf. The use of the sail, and when it first appeared, is a murky subject, and I don't mean to suggest that it could not have been used by prehistoric man all around the globe. It certainly could have been. We saw how the oldest depiction of the sail is from around 3300 BC, and the real rub is that any use of the sail before then 
would probably have been with a sail made from organic material, material that would not have survived in an archaeological context. That's really the problem with many of the prehistoric boats that we've seen today, so I'll have to leave this episode open-ended to a degree, just because we don't have concrete proof for much of this and when it first appeared in history. Still, the various rudimentary boat forms in use today are fascinating, and they seem to give us a good window into the past to see what basic boat forms would likely have been used. After all, there is a cutoff line beneath which an object can't float at all. We know mankind reached some of these remote islands and migrated at an early point in history, and they had to cross open water to get there, so boat forms must have been similar to even the basic boats and floats used by modern man in certain contexts. Now, before I sign off today, I wanted to tell you about two books that were really helpful in putting together this episode. Both of them were written by Sean McGrail, who is currently a visiting professor at the University of Southampton, and who was, for 13 years, the chief archaeologist at the National Maritime Museum in Greenwich, England. These two books are both entitled Early Ships and Seafaring, with one of them covering European water transport and the other covering water transport beyond Europe. The name shared by these two volumes should make it clear why I found them to be useful in cobbling together today's subject matter. They each cover much of what's now known about early ships and seafaring, and they do so in a very organized and concise manner. That being the case, they don't focus on many topics in super great detail, but they are a wonderful primer on the high points of maritime history, BCE. Another characteristic of this set that I have appreciated for the podcast, but that I think would be helpful for anyone interested in maritime history and archaeology, is that Professor McGrail has the hands-on experience necessary to make these books highly informative and to cover aspects that many books overlook. He covers the basics of all the boat types that we talked about today. He really hits most of what we've covered on the podcast so far, to be honest. But he also includes topics like navigation techniques and pilotage methods used by the cultures present in various regions around the world. That is how the books are organized, by region, that is. Each region then looks at the types of watercraft present from prehistory, up through the first few centuries AD, even later in some cases. After that, McGrail then looks at navigation techniques common to the region, and though we haven't talked about those topics too much yet, we will work them in where they fit most logically, I promise. The volume that covers the water transport of Europe, being more narrowly focused, naturally covers ships and boats up through a more recent period, the early medieval period. If you are interested in getting a very well-organized discussion of early water transport around the globe, this two-volume set by Professor McGraw is a great place to get that. The books also contain generous helpings of pictures, diagrams, and maps to help illustrate the points being made, or the types of ship or construction being discussed. Naturally, I will include links and a written review of this set on the website, and if you're interested in purchasing them, your use of the links on the podcast website to go to Amazon will garner us a small cut for the referral. Finally today, thanks to Littermo2 for the kind review on iTunes. It really means a lot. Whether you've been listening to the podcast since our beginning, somewhere in the middle, or you just discovered us, your support can help us continue to produce quality maritime history content. iTunes reviews are always helpful and much appreciated. Or if you'd like to support us monetarily, you can learn about how best to do that by visiting the website, maritimehistorypodcast.com, and clicking on Become a Crew Member. <laughs> 
we have premium episodes for supporters of a certain level. So check that out if you're always looking for more history in your life. That's all I've got on the agenda for today. I'll be putting out our Season 1 recap episode here in the near future, and then after that we'll be moving on to Season 2 before much longer. Thanks for the continued support, everyone, and until next time, thanks for listening to the Maritime History Podcast.